And please be seated. Well, God leads us now to the time of fellowship, uh, still in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses th- uh, verse 13. It says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So, brothers and sisters, we're going to come now to the public reading of Scripture and to a time of exhortation and teaching as I will bring the word to you today from the book of Philippians. So if you would, uh, turn now in your Bibles uh, to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. There should be an a outline in your bulletin if you want to locate that and follow along with me here this morning. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is the word of Almighty God. I ask that out of respect and reverence for him, you stand now at the reading of his holy word. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we come before you this day, uh, through your word, through the exhortation of your word, that you would use it to magnify your name, that you would use it to exalt your son, and that, Father, you would use it to build us up, to build up your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Even if you know, knew very little about military strategy, even nothing about military strategy, I'm sure you've probably at least heard of divide and conquer. That if you can divide your foe as a united force in in their strength, if you can divide them, that it's easier to conquer them. That this is is something that that, uh, people do in in battle. They seek to, to divide the ranks so that they can conquer. Even better, if you can turn them against each other, that's, that's even better. We saw uh, Paul exhibited this when he stood before the Sanhedrin. If you remember, when he went before the Sanhedrin on trial, he, he faced a unified foe. They were against him. They were against the way. They were against the Christian religion. But Paul perceived that half of them were Pharisees and half of them were Sadducees. And so what did he do? He cried out in their midst, I'm a Pharisee. I'm here on trial today because I'm a Pharisee. I'm here because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And he turned them against each other and they fought against each other. And he was delivered from their hand. Jesus recognized this principle when he said that any kingdom that is divided against itself is laid waste, or any city or any house that is is divided cannot stand. And he said that in reference to to Satan's kingdom, that Satan's kingdom is united. Satan's kingdom is is organized. Satan's kingdom is is a unified foe. And so Satan understands the, the strength and power of unity. And that is why one of his schemes is to seek to divide Christ's kingdom, to seek to divide the church, to seek to divide denominations and congregations and homes. We certainly see his strategy played out in church splits. If you were to look at the history of of, uh, Presbyterianism in America, unfortunately, it's a history of splits. That's why sometimes we're called the split peas. And obviously, it's it's not just at the denominational level, it's, it's at the congregational level. How many times are, are, are congregations divided? And sometimes it's over doctrine. Sometimes it's for valid reason, over essential truths of the Christian faith. 
But many times it's simply because the people can't get along. Because the, the, the leadership or the members can't get along. And how many times behind these splits is pride the reason behind it? Pride and selfishness lurking behind and, and causing the things that lead to the splits. I'm sure that if we did a, por- a post-mortem on the majority of church splits in, in, in America, uh, accepting the ones that were for doctrinal reasons, that we would probably find that pride is behind it. That some leader, some pastor, puffed up in pride, becomes a despot and begun, begins ruling over people and, and dividing and driving them out. Or you might have somebody from the congregation who doesn't like the leadership. And like Absalom, they stand at the gate and say, oh, that I were king. I would do this and I would do that. And begins to draw the people out after themselves and divides the congregation. Or you find some faction within that is self-seeking, has their own motives, their own interests. And they begin spreading their, their dissatisfaction like leaven. And the, the little leaven leavens the whole lump. And before you know it, a split occurs. And that is why, brothers and sisters, humility is absolutely essential for unity. That if we are going to be united as a body, if we are going to stay in, in a healthy unity, we must have humility. And that is the, the thrust of this passage before us this morning. That humility leads to unity. We have in it the example of Jesus, who is the greatest example of humility that ever existed. But Paul, when he gives this example of Christ and his humility, is doing it to support his, 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 the idea of unity. That it is humility that leads to unity. And Christ is the greatest example of humility. So that is the doctrine we're going to consider as we work our way through. That humility leads to unity. And Christ is the greatest example of humility. We're going to look at it in three parts. First, we're going to look at the reason for humility. It's unity in verses 1 through 4. Then we'll look at the example of humility, which is Christ, in verses 5 through 8. And then finally, we'll look at the result of of humility, which is exaltation, in verses 9 through 11. Paul is writing this letter. He's, he's, He's in prison at the time of the writing. And he's writing to the Philippians, speaking to them about their participation in the gospel, letting them know about his affairs that has happened because of the the cause of the gospel. That's why he is imprisoned. That's why he is in Rome. And he writes to them in verse 27 of chapter 1. And he tells them, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So you see what Paul is after. He's saying that this is how you walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, that you be united in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith. And then in chapter 2, he picks up with the therefore, and he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then be united He's appealing to these things because these are the elements that if these exist, we already have the the necessary elements for unity in a church. He speaks of encouragement in Christ and consolation of love. Both of these words refer to coming alongside somebody, encouraging them, exhorting them, consoling them. And the reason why they point towards unity is because if you're exhorting somebody, if you're consoling somebody, if you're encouraging somebody, you're already other-minded. You're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about the other person. And as we'll see as we work through that, uh, work through the passage, that that selfless mindset is absolutely essential for unity in the body. So Paul says, if this already exists amongst you, Philippians, if you're already doing it, if you're already encouraging one another, if you're already consoling one another, and then he says, if there's already fellowship of the Spirit, it is the Spirit that creates the unity. It is our job to endeavor to keep it. Ephesians chapter 4, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Spirit is the one who unites us together in one body. Christ is the head. We have all been made to drink of one Spirit. So if we're already thinking of others, if we're already consoling and encouraging one another, if there's already the unity of the Spirit, and he says if there's already affection and compassion, if you, if you have a love for one another, if you have a compassion for one another, if you are willing to overlook one another's faults, Remember, as the elect of God, we are to put on tender mercies, bowels of compassion. We are to forgive one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. He's saying, look, Philippians, if these things already exist in you, then fulfill my joy 
by being united. Remember, too, that Paul is in prison. This is, his joy is the, is the unity of the church. I wonder if, if we were in prison, what our joy would be. Would it be an extra thing of, of cup of noodle at commissary or a microwave burrito uh, or a, a visit from a friend? Would we have the, the unity of the church on our mind? Is it a burden for us this morning? Is it something that you think about in your prayer life? Are you praying for the unity of this church, the unity of our denomination, the unity of the leaders, the unity of our missionaries? Are you praying for these things? Paul says, fulfill my love by being united. And he tells us the means to unity in, in, in like-mindedness and humility. Look with me at verse 2. He says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. This really is the thrust of the passage. We are going to see the, the, perhaps one of the greatest uh, statements of Christ in all of Scripture as we work our way through this passage. But you have to know that, that all that Paul says after this is supporting this one thing, that he is looking for unity. He is after unity. This is what he is encouraging the Philippians to, and it's what the Scriptures are encouraging us to this morning. First, he says that we are to be of the same mind. Literally, we are to think the same things. This is part of the benefit of being a confessional church. We know that we believe the same things. We all adhere to the same standards. It's one of the benefits of, of being part of a confessional church because I know that I believe the same thing as my fellow officers. I know I believe the same thing as the other officers in the OPC. I know I believe the same thing as the missionaries that we send out, that we are united. We think the same thing. I know, brothers and sisters, that I think the same thing as you, that we have the same mindset because we hold to the same doctrine. But it's not enough to hold to the same doctrine. There's been a lot of churches that believe the same things, but they split because they could not get along. And that's why Paul says not only to be of the same mind, but to maintain the same love, to love one another, to have affection for one another, that we would be dear to each other, that we would love one, one another, forgiving one another, and that we would be tender to one another. But that's not enough either. Because there have been churches that have been of the same mind, have held the same doctrine. They even had love for one another, but they couldn't agree on which direction to go. And that's why Paul says that they should also be united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That they should all think, be thinking about the same thing. That we should be united in our purpose. And if you don't know what the purpose of this church is, perhaps you should go and look on the website. But I'll tell you, so you don't have to do your homework. That our church exists, first and foremost, to worship God. To, to worship him most honorably and notably. But part of that is teaching and instructing others on how to do so. And that's where discipleship comes in. Not only the people who are here, but going out and finding others who do not yet worship God. That's where outreach comes in. So that's where you find the, the three kind of you know, ministries within our church. We have worship, we have the equipping of the saints, and we have outreach. But all of it is driving towards worship. Making disciples, teaching them how to worship. It is the spiritual mission of the church. There have been times where, where churches have lost sight of this mission, have gone off the deep end for uh, political focus or social agendas or other things, and they've lost sight of the Great Commission. So we are to be united in our beliefs, we are be t- to be united in our love for one another, and we are be- to be united in our single purpose uh, in, in, our, in our mission of the church. That is what the apostle is after. But we also need humility in order to do this. And that's what he speaks of in verses 3 and 4. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. These are two enemies to like-mindedness. These are two enemies to unity. Selfishness and pride selfishness and vain conceit because immediately as soon as you start thinking about yourself only thinking about your own interests only thinking about your own needs you have ceased to view the body as a whole you've ceased to think about the health of the body as the whole all you think about is yourself and your own needs so Paul here says if you're going to be united you cannot be selfish do not merely look out for your own personal interests but also for the interest of others 
But he also speaks of the pride that is such an enemy to unity. The pride, as he says, do nothing through selfishness and empty conceit, but, through, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. I have to confess that every time I've read this in the past, before really digging into this passage, I always thought that this statement where it says, regard one another as more important than yourselves, was really just an extension of the next verse. Don't merely look out for your own personal interest. But Paul is addressing two things. He's, ad- he's addressing selfishness, and he's, ad- he's addressing vainglory, pride, conceit. The answer to selfishness is to not look out uh, for your own personal interests, but to look out for the interests of others. The answer to pride and vainglory and conceit is to think of others as greater than yourselves. Literally, to think of somebody to be more important than you are, to think of someone to be greater than you are. Is that your mindset this morning? Is that your mindset in, in church? Do you think of other people as, as more gifted, as superior, as greater? as a being of a higher rank than you, as being better than you? Or do you think of yourself as, as being God's gift to the church, God's gift to Bethel, and, and that you are the greatest? Brothers and sisters, be on guard. We are to do nothing through selfishness or empty conceit. How many times has somebody's own personal interests caused division in the church? You hear about people uh, dividing over, over silly things, you obviously hear about the color of the paint in the Sunday school room or the color of the roof. But there are other examples, people who might not like a song or might not like the music. And, and instead of thinking about other people, how that song or that music might assist them in the worship of God, they begin to grumble and complain and to cause division. Or perhaps they don't like the way a Sunday school class is taught because their child, their little one, is not being built up but they fail to realize that all the other children in the class are. And instead of thinking about others, all they can think about is themselves. And they begin to divide and cause dissension amongst the ranks. Or perhaps they're tired of a sermon series. And instead of thinking about how that series might be blessing their brothers and sisters, how God might be speaking to, to a wayward saint through that series, all they can think about is themselves and their own fatness and, and how uh, they're not, their needs aren't being met. And they begin to cause dissension in the ranks. And so Paul tells us to do nothing through our own personal interest, to look out for the interest of others, to be thinking about other people. And there is no one who has done this greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the the perfect example of selflessness, the perfect example of humility. And we see that now as we turn to the second point in verses uh, 5 through 8. It says in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to look to Christ as our example. We are to think like Christ thinks. We are literally to have the mind of Christ. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What is that attitude? Verses 6 and 7. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. There is a lot here, so let's work our way through it. Let's, let's, let's look at this point by point. First, in, in uh, verse 6, it says, "Who, Although he existed in the form of God. This refers to his glory, to his majesty. Remember I quoted uh, John 17, 5 last week, where Jesus prayed to the Father and he said, Father, glorify me together with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world was, before the foundation of the world. Christ existed in the outward manifestation of the glory of God. He had the majesty of the Father. He was acknowledged as the second person of the Trinity, that there is one God, there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one God, equal in, uh, of the same substance, equal in power and glory. That Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity from all eternity, manifested the glory of God and was acknowledged as God. So it says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not rec- regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now we have to understand what this word means, a thing to be grasped. It comes from a verb that means to snatch, to, to plunder, it's, it's referred of, uh, it speaks to robbers who go out and they snatch things and they plunder things and they get the booty from the spoil. But it also, over time, not only came to refer to the act of snatching, the act of plundering, 
but also to the act of holding on to what was obtained, what was, what was um, uh, gained in the plunder. So it came to be thought of as a thing to be prized. This is, this, it became an idiom in, in Greek. All the Greek fathers understood it this way. And so we should understand it that way as well. That it is, Jesus was saying that he did not require equality with God, a thing to be held onto, a thing to be retained, a thing to be prized. So we need to be careful now. Because what are we saying here? When, G, when we say that Jesus did not, require, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be retained, a thing to be prized. Well, we can't obviously be speaking of his divine nature. We have to be speaking of, of rank. We have to be speaking of the glory that we spoke of in, in, in the form of God. We have to be speaking of the acknowledgement that he received, that he was willing to forego that, that acknowledgement. He was willing to forego that glory. And if you look at it in verse 7, it becomes a little clearer. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. This is the kenosis passage. If you've ever studied uh, uh, Christology, if you've ever, ever studied theology, you know that this word here where it says he emptied himself, the Greek word is kanao, it means to empty. And it says that Christ emptied himself. So we have to understand what this means. Because Christ, in his divine nature, is equal with God. By being the Son of God, he is equal with God. He never ceased to be equal with God. So what is it that he, he did when he emptied himself? There are heretics who say that he emptied himself of some of his divine attributes. They'll say that in Jesus, he had the... Uh, absolute attributes and he had the relative attributes and that when he became a man he gave up his relative attributes of omniscience omnipotence and omnipresence that when he became a man he gave up those attributes though he retained the attributes of love and mercy and justice and and all of the the uh, characteristic attributes that we think of God but brothers and sisters that is complete and total heresy Jesus did not give up one single divine attribute when he became man because God is immutable. God cannot change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In God, there is no variation or shadow of turning. It is impossible for Jesus to have given up one single divine attribute because it's impossible for God to change. It also speaks to the simplicity of God, that God is his attributes. He is not a, a composition made up of various attributes that he can take some and put aside and retain the others. No, God is his attributes. And as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, throughout his entire incarnation, retained every single one of his divine attributes, omniscience, om omnipresence, and omnipotence. That while he was in the womb of his mother, while she was giving him nourishment and upholding him in, his, in her womb, that he was the one upholding her by the word of his power. That throughout his entire life, he upheld all things. He upheld the very breath of the people who cried out, crucify him. He upheld the very lives of the ones who nailed the spike into his hand. He upheld the elements and the, the atoms of the iron in the spike that went through his hand. He upheld held all things by the word of his power. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's understand what is, is being said here. That Jesus who although he existed in the form of God, although he had all the glory and majesty and acknowledgement of God, when he became man, he gave up that acknowledgement. He was no longer acknowledged as God. And we see that in the scriptures. One, the scripture I've already told you. Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. But we also see it in John chapter 1, where it says that he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. We see it in Isaiah 53 where it says there is no form or comeliness, no, no beauty, no majesty that we should desire him. That in his human flesh, his glory was veiled except for one time. You remember that one time where his glory shone forth in the transfiguration, where it literally says he, his form was changed before the very eyes of the disciples, that he was metamorphosized, that Jesus on the Mount of trans, Transfiguration, his, the, the divine glory shone forth and he became bright white as light. And they saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in his human flesh, in his incarnation. So we see the humiliation of Christ. We see his humility that although he, was, he is equal with God in his nature, 
He was willing to take a lower rank when he became man, because man is, no doubt, lower than God. That he, was, he did not require equality with God as a thing to be held on to, the acknowledgement of his, of his divine majesty and splendor, but he was willing to take a lower position. And that is what we need to pay attention to today. Because there are many times in our lives where we are going to be called to submit to our equals. Jesus is equal with the Father, but he was willing to humble himself. Note that. The Father did not humble him. The Father did not empty him. He emptied himself. He is the one who humbled himself. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Learn from me, because I am humble and lowly of heart. Jesus humbled himself. Though he was equal with God, he took on the lower rank. And we are called to do the same. If we are going to have unity in the body, remember the purpose of the passage is unity. Remember the purpose of the illustration is to learn from Christ, to have the mind of Christ, to think like he thought. Though he was equal with God, he was willing to, to, to be subjected to the Father. And though we are equal to one another in our natures, are we willing to be subjected to one another? Are we willing to think of one another as greater than ourselves? Are we willing to take the lower rank? We see this, obviously, in, in the voluntary vows that people take of church membership, that the laity vows to submit to the, to the clergy. It's not that the elders in any way, uh, in essence, are anything greater than the congregants. But in terms of rank, you have humbled yourselves and, and vowed to submit to the leadership. Think of marriage. Obviously, we are called to, to submit to one another. But particularly the woman is called to submit to the man, the wife to the husband. It's not that the husband is, is in any way of, of a greater essence than the woman. No, God created man male and female after his own image. We are both made in the image of God. But in the course of God's providence, in his design, the woman is to humble herself, to take the lower rank. We see it in children. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. It's not that children, in essence, are lower than their parents. But in rank, they are. Same thing with employees and employers. We see this many times, brothers and sisters. It's a call to humility. It's a call to submit ourselves and not to think highly of ourselves. And it's, it's absolutely essential for unity. But perhaps you say, well, I, I want to be something great. I don't want to humble myself. Well, you need to learn the path to greatness from the scriptures. Because the Bible says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And we see that in the Lord Jesus Christ as we look at verses 9 through 11. We see the result of humiliation. It says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's look at the two ways in which Christ is, is exalted. First, he's exalted in verse 9 in receiving the name. It says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. There's a lot of question about this. What is the name? What is the name that Jesus received in his exaltation? Is it the name Jesus? Because it says, At the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Is it the name Lord? Because it says every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Is it the name Yahweh? What is the name that Jesus received? What is it? Well, it can't be the name Jesus, because when did Jesus receive the name Jesus? He didn't receive it at his exaltation. He received it at his birth, right? You, you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will deliver his people from their sins. It can't be the name Lord, because he possessed that name. You call me Lord, Lord. Why don't you do the things that I say? Jesus was called Lord throughout his ministry. It can't be the name Yahweh because he possessed that name from all of eternity. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. So what is the name that Jesus received in his exaltation? For that, we have to understand that the word name is not always used for an epithet, something that we call somebody. Sometimes it refers to status. Sometimes it refers to reputation. Sometimes it refers to rank. We even use that today. Somebody has made a name for himself in sales or made a name for himself in this or that. Think of those who were building the Tower of Babel. They said, let us build a tower. Why? So that we might make a name for ourselves. Jesus, in speaking to the churches in Revelation, told one of them, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. 
So here we see that the word name can refer to reputation, to status, to majesty, to glory. And that is how it is used here, that Jesus, though he was humbled to the lowest depth in, in his humanity, though he was willing to be humbled in becoming a man, though he was willing to be humbled in becoming obedient even to the point of death, Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. The shameful death of the cross, we spoke of that last week, that he, was, that he underwent the cursed death of the cross. Whoever hangs on a tree is cursed. Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Deuteronomy and Galatians. That Jesus, though he was willing to humble himself to the lowest depth, God exalted him to the highest height. That he gave him the name which is above every name. That he exalted him far above all angels and principalities and powers. That Jesus is exalted in his human nature, now as the God-man, in the hypostatic union. That he is both God and man, fully God, fully man. That he is exalted to the right hand of God the Father, waiting for every nation to be subjected to him. That all the peoples should be made a footstool for his feet. So he is exalted in receiving the name, but it also says that he is exalted in receiving worship. Look with me at verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You might not realize this, but this is an allusion to a quote, a prophecy from the Old Testament. It comes from Isaiah 45, 23. And let me just read this to you. It says, Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from, from, from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Now listen. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Who's speaking in that passage? Who's the subject of that passage? Who is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance? Is it not God, the Lord, none other than Yahweh himself? And now here in our passage, who is it speaking of? Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he should receive the worship of none other but God himself, because he is God. Now, finally, he's acknowledged as God, though he was Though prior to his incarnation, he was acknowledged as God, and in his incarnation, he was not acknowledged by God, as God except by his disciples. Now in his, uh, now in his exaltation, once again, he's acknowledged to be who he truly is, the second person of the Trinity, none other than God Almighty, none other than Yahweh. So we see that every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. I couldn't help but thinking of the Ten Commandments when I read this. It's not an exact parallel, but in the Ten Commandments, we're told to, that, that we are not to make any image of the things in heaven or on earth or the under the earth, and we're not to bow down to them. But now here we see the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the Father, the express image of his glory, and we see the things in heaven, the things in earth, the things under the earth, bowing down and giving worship to him. Not only that, but it says that, they, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you remember in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, there, is no, there are no consonants, or sorry, there are no vowels. There are only consonants. So the, the name of God is four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton. A Yod, a He, a Vav, and a He. And so when the Jews, out of reverence and respect for God, came across the name of God in the scripture of the Old Testament, they never pronounced it. You won't hear a Jew pronounce the name Yahweh or Jehovah or Yavah. They will always simply say Adonai, which is the, the Hebrew word for Lord. And if it's, if it's combined with Lord and God, sometimes they'll, so if the Hebrew says Adonai Yahweh, then they'll say Adonai Elohim. But they never say the name of God. And this was carried over in the tradition when the scriptures were translated from the Hebrew into the Greek in the Septuagint. When the translators came to the word Yahweh, when they came to the name of God, they didn't transliterate it. They didn't seek to put the Hebrew pronunciation into Greek letters. They simply wrote the Greek word for Lord. 
And so many times, not always, but many times in the scriptures, when we see the word Lord, we need to look at the context and we need to understand what is being referred to here. Is it simply that he is the master? Or is it that he is none other than Yahweh himself? And no doubt that is what is being said here, that every knee will bow to him. Every knee will give him the homage that is due to God alone. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Yahweh, that he is the Lord, that he is God. So we see the humiliation of Christ. We see the exaltation of Christ. We see the principle that whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But remember, once again, I'm going to tell you to remember the context. It's so easy to, to, to look at this passage and get so lost in the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that happens, hey, go for it. Uh, I'm never going to fault you for that. that it happens to me. I, I read this and all I can think about is Christ and his love for us and his, and his beauty and his humility and his willingness to undergo such shame and, and such hardship for me. His willing to give up uh, the glory and the acknowledgement that he had with the Father before the ages, to, to humble himself, to take on the form of a servant, to take on the form of a man, and to, to, for, for us, for, for our exaltation, for our salvation. So if you're lost in the wonder of Christ, I, I do not fault you. If you're lost in the wonder of what he has done, I do not fault you. But I do want to bring you back to the passage. I want to remind you of the purpose of Paul giving us the example of the Lord Jesus. And it is that humility leads to unity. That we are to have the mind of Christ. That we are to think like him so that we might be united in one body that we might have the same mind, that we might have the same love, that we might have the same purpose, that we would be united together in love. So as we close this morning, brothers and sisters, let me ask you, where are you in this? I spoke at the beginning about Satan and his strategy to divide, that it is the, one of the devices of the evil one is, is to cause division, uh, to cause strife, has he made any inroads within our ranks? Has he made any inroads within your hearts? Has he already made progress in causing division? Is there someone in your, in your family, in your life? Is there strife in your marriage? Is there strife in your relationships? Remember in, in the book of Philippians in chapter 4 that Paul had to speak to Yodian and uh, Syntyche, these women in the church who just couldn't get along. Is there anybody in this body that you can't get along with? Is there anybody that, in this body that you're at odds with, that you're fighting with, that you don't like? Is there anybody in your household that you're at odds with, that you're fighting with, that you don't like? Have you become disenchanted and disgruntled with the church, with Bethel? Was there a time that you came and you were happy to be here, but now you're annoyed, you don't like it, things get on your nerves, and, and you, you have one foot out the door? If so, why? Why? Evaluate yourself. Is it possible that some selfishness or some pride is behind it? Remember that selfishness and pride are, are the enemies of unity. They are the things that destroy the unity. They destroy the like-mindedness. If you're unhappy with somebody, if you're unhappy about something, why is it? Is it because you have some selfish motive? Is it because you're thinking about yourself? Or is it because you're thinking of the body? Is it because you think you're better than somebody? You could do something better, some ministry better. What is it, brothers and sisters, that is causing division, if there is division? What is it that is causing strife? Be careful. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Be on guard against Satan. It says that we are not to allow him to take advantage of us because we are not foolish of his devices. Don't be foolish of his schemes. If you find yourself discontent this morning, if you find yourself upset at somebody in the church, in the family, in your personal life, know that Satan might be behind it. Look out for the evil one. He is a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. But perhaps you do have a valid grievance. Perhaps you, you evaluate your heart, you evaluate your life, and, and you, you say, yeah, you know, the things that I have against this person, or the things I have uh, against the church at this time, they're not for selfish reasons. They're not for prideful reasons. What are you doing about it? If it's for the good of the church, are you doing anything about it? Have you gone to the elders? Have you gone to the person? You know, we say it often. The elder meetings are open. There might come a time where we enter into closed session, but the elder meetings are open. Anybody can come and talk. Anybody can come. If you have a, if you have a burden for the people, you know something that would be better, then come and speak. 
But make sure it's not out of a selfish motive. Make sure that it's not out of pride. And make sure that you're not doing it in a manner that causes division, that spreads strife, instead of going to the person speaking behind their backs, instead of coming to the session speaking and and causing division in the church. Brothers and sisters, we need to watch and pray against this. We need to remember the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to think like he thinks. We need to remember that humility leads to unity. Let's follow the example of Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, this is a sobering passage. It's it's one that I'm sure that each and every one of us would confess that we are stricken by because we do so many things out of selfish motives, not only in the church, but in our homes, in our relationships, in our friendships, in, in all of our lives, in our work environments. Father, we are selfish people, and oftentimes we do things out of pride, that pride and selfishness go hand in hand, because anyone who is selfish is one who thinks that he is greater, thinks that his needs and his wants and his desires are more important than those of others. Father, we pray that you would give us the mind of Christ, that you would give us the humility that he had, that we'd be willing to subject ourselves, to take the lower rank, that we would not need the acknowledgement of others, that we'd be willing to humble ourselves in your sight and allow you to exalt us and raise us up. Father, we pray for the unity of this body. We pray that we would be like-minded, that we would be intent on one purpose, that we would have a love for one another, affections for one another, that we would show tenderness and compassion and mercy to one another, that we would be willing to forgive one another, even as you have forgiven us in Christ. Father, please work this in our midst. Keep us from any division. Keep us from any splits. Keep us united, uh, walking in a manner worthy of the gospel, united in spirit, striving together for the faith of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.